Hi everyone, thanks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> looks like everyone can see my screen. Um, thanks for answering the poll there. I agree with Jeff, that was my favorite as well. Um, Istio making its way into CNCF. Um, that's that's really awesome. Um, you know, we should we should come back in a year's time and do this one again and, and see how much different it is. My expectation is we'll you know have a completely different kettle of fish um, in terms of uh, capabilities and add-ons. Um, typically, open source projects um, like Kubernetes, you know, really take took off uh, once the community rallies around it. Um, yeah, that's me, um, you guys, and everyone will have um, a copy of the slide decks as well in, in the handouts, I believe. So um, if you want to reach out um, anytime, just uh, go for it. Talk, talk a little bit more about whatever, really. Um, so we're talking about modern application platform. That's sort of how I framed it. Um, but yeah, definitely it's going to be centered around service mesh um, and specifically Istio in this case. Um, I, we call it application platform because we sit um, at the top level of your stack. Um, so, you know, I thought it'd be good to sort of level set everyone on where where we really fit in terms of service mesh. Um, so I think most people probably are aware of Kubernetes and using Kubernetes actively. Kubernetes has become the de facto container orchestrator um, and it's well established within enterprise environments, um, you know, since the big names like IBM and VMware have invested in it. Um, enterprises are already adopting um, and then with that you know we've been able to get our applications in there as well um, you know our services and everything is in there running as we want them in the cloud native architectures and microservices and and that's all great um, uh, with that success obviously comes um, a lot of scale as well um, and and that's really where we feel um, in the last maybe eight to eight months to a year, um, things have changed where organizations are now saying, okay, well, we've got these applications in our cloud native platform, um, but how do we secure them? We, you know, security has sort of taken a back step. Um, and so that's really where service mesh is coming in to, you know, almost save the day. Um, and that's why I think it's a, it's quite an interesting topic to talk about, um, you know, how um, service mesh is sitting really almost at a layer above Kubernetes um, to, to bring the security. Um, yeah, so just a brief history on, on how we got here and, you know, sort of, one of the things we want to look out for in terms of our application networking platform is um, that it is cloud native um, or Kubernetes native. Um, if we look at how this all started, um, it, it all started with containers and, and Docker, you know, really um, changing how applications are packaged and developed um, and, you know, developers quickly, you know, adopted that. And um, after that became, you know, mainstream, we we required the container orchestrators. And, and that's really where Kubernetes stepped in and it has become the de facto container orchestrator. There's, there's multiple versions of container orchestrators, but really today Kubernetes is, is the de facto container orchestrator. So for those two technologies build on, and on each other, their success Really hey, Dan. What, yeah. Um, there's just a little bit of buzzing when you're talking. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, see if I can change. So, my microphone. Sorry, everyone. I'm sitting here thinking to myself, is that me? Is that, hey. is that any better? Try, try again. Any better? Uh, hard to say. I don't know. No, not really. Now? 
little bit, I think. Again, hard to say. No, I think that is better. It's just a little yeah. bit. It's not not as loud. Um, okay. So you might just need to speak up a bit. Sorry. Okay. So yeah, um, that that's the history of um, how, no, I'll how we. Back. Yeah. I'll take Sorry. it back. That's way worse. That's way worse. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Let me get to the mic setting. Sorry, man. No, no, that's all good. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard. Sorry, to... everyone. We'll get there. Uh... Is that better? Can you hear Just me? Just while we wait. Oh, that's beautiful. Look at that. Is that better? Yeah, yeah right, that's cool. much better. Cool. Sorry, man. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, uh, so so containers, container orchestration, Kubernetes, they, they really changed the game for loads of reasons. I think we can talk about those for hours and days um, easily. Um, I think the important thing is, is that service mesh and your application networking needs to follow in that cloud native pattern as well. So, um, you know, the service meshes need to be um, Kubernetes native to really continue with that um, decoupling of, you know, developers and the platform and, and platform concerns. That's really um, what containers and Kubernetes have done for us. Uh, so hopefully we'll see, see a bit of that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the time you, you'll think about, you know, sort of, service mesh, when do we start, how do we start? Um, it's, a, it's a common thing we come across. Uh, I thought I'd put this in here. Um, if, you, if you're wondering how to get into it, um, you know, this is a good, good way to look at it. I mean, organizations and your organization may be different. You may start at the fly side um, or anywhere in between here, but, you know, typically it would be ingress or api gateway that's that's the classic thing you have your kubernetes cluster and your cloud native applications people need to access it uh, and you have an api gateway and then as that sort of matures and you start looking at well okay how do we secure everything um, that's typically where the next phase for a service mesh uh, comes into play um, and then really once you've bedded your service mesh in um, you know, things will scale again, um, success usually comes, um, and, you know, you start getting into multi-cluster um, and multi-mesh environments. Um, and um, after that, you know, with multi-meshes and multi-clouds, um, you're really looking at that global service routing side of things as well. So that's sort of a, a typical progression into service mesh um, that we see quite a bit. Uh, and we'll we'll see a little bit of all of this as well. Okay, so just before I sort of get into a few more slides, um, we can kick off the next poll, please. Uh, I'll try and figure out what's going on here. Oh, there we go. Yep. So. People are in there. Okay, it looks like we've got a nice mix. Uh, a lot of people are saying, um, you know, they they do use Kubernetes, so so that's good. <laughs> a lot of the talk will be around that, um, and a lot of the technology is is uh, built around that. Um, Thanks for answering. I will continue. I think just under what, half. Sorry. What I find really interesting about that is people are definitely going toward multiple clusters these days. That's probably the biggest topology change I've seen over the last couple of years, right? That's a big, that's a very interesting topic. Um, you know, almost, yeah. it almost falls into multi tenancy. So, um, you know, a lot of the time we're seeing 
multiple clusters are there and not necessary for the classic reasons of non-production, various non-production and then production environment. Um, uh, sometimes organizations will just go, um, you know, it's easier for us to have that tenancy isolation on a per cluster basis. Um, we've, we've even seen crazy things like, you know, on a per application or per team. Business basis. unit. Yeah, business unit and team. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> not, it's not unusual, yeah. So, cool. So, um, everyone can see the results, right? So is that looks that way? Is that right, Scott? Uh, they should have been able to see yes. Yeah, okay. Anyway, so I don't have to tell everyone they can see it. All right, so Great. challenges. Uh, let's let's do it. Um, <clears throat> so we're pretty much in a world of APIs, um, cloud-native microservices architectures. That doesn't mean you have to be microservices. Um, your APIs could be running in the, let's say, monolithic type environments um, the challenges are the same um, and has always been the same for us since we've had applications on it systems um, you know how do we manage these services how do we secure them um, and how do we you know keep them up and running observe them monitor them um, and service mesh really comes in at that application layer um, that application networking layer um, you know we can you know dumb it down to this slide where you have one service whether that's sitting on a server bare metal cloud in Kubernetes container whatever um, or application architectures eventually will be talking to something else there's a dependency on some other service um, and so that dependency and that communication is what we call the application network layer um, and that's your level seven um, you know, that's where service mesh sits, it's in that communication. And, you know, as we said, throughout, you know, history with applications and IT systems, we've had certain patterns and standards that we want for that communication. How do we make it more resilient? How do we have a better user experience? Um, you know, 12 factors of application development, you know, all those sort of things have been developed over the many decades we're doing application architectures um, and you know usually it was built into maybe application code or or some other hardware but these are the things that we want out of our application network you know we want service discovery load balancing timeouts and retries and circuit breakers that bring that resilience to your application we want to be able to do that triage and tracing and observability metrics, all of that. We want obviously security, um, and we want to be able to um, extend it as well. Not not necessarily having to follow, let's say, just the Istio way of doing it, but you know, some organisations will maybe have a niche requirement for the application network. How do they um, safely bring that into that application network? So these are the sort of things that we, you know, requirements that we want out of our um, application network uh, and service mesh um, really brings um, and decouples that from your developer. So this is maybe where we came, you know, previously what we can call traditional application architecture, you know, you had your app. Uh, API management, or all centralized, all a specialist team um, between them uh, and your API services and application services. You would have load balancers and firewalls and proxies um, and all sorts of layers of um, hardware. And uh, the problem with that was is that it's you know it doesn't scale um, when when you start doing cloud native microservices, um, you really need that ephemeral nature of how these services work um, to really leverage the Kubernetes container orchestrator um, and what it brings as a platform, you know, you want to be more dynamic than this. So that no longer works. Um, 
you know, we're in a world now where, you know, our services are sitting in clusters um, and, you know, the service will be here one minute and gone the next minute. A new service will, you know, appear somewhere in another cluster and we want to be able to communicate with them. Um, and that's all sitting in your um, application network level. So, um, you know, it's all decentralized. There's no centralized control um, or for, for your data path. Um, okay, so that's that's sort of a quick nutshell, I suppose, on, on the challenges and, and, you know, the history on containers, orchestration, application networking, and what it is. Um, and the challenges that come with those architectures, you know, why, um, you know, what we've learned from from history so far um, in terms of them. Um, so we'll we'll take a quick look at, you know, service mesh and the application networking and and how uh, it sort of brings a solution to a problem. Okay, so it looks like, um, yeah, not, not too unusual. Um, service mesh is still not in production uh, for, for our crowd here tonight. Um, and yeah, that's not unusual. I'm, you know, uh, there's some of us in production with service mesh, so that's good. Um, it's, it's had a bumpy history. Um, I think that's changed dramatically in the last 12 months so um yeah that's that's also why i'm here you know let's let's revisit the topic let's you know um try and break down any stigmas that that may have been around this sort of concept and approaches um so yeah as we said um service mesh is about service to service communication um and and whether that service is sitting uh, in a Kubernetes cluster or two different clusters or whether it's in a Kubernetes cluster and a VM, um, it doesn't matter. Service Mesh um, connects your application services to each other. Um, in its sort of most high-level side, Service Meshes tend to have a control plane um, and a data plane. Um, and Typically, um, you know, like, like Kubernetes has become the de facto um, container orchestrator, Envoy Proxy has become the de facto service proxy for um, service meshes. Um, and Envoy Proxy um, was developed with distributed systems in mind uh, from day one. It went and said, okay, that slide that we had about hardware-based um, um, static load balancers and firewalls and so on um, just couldn't scale to this ephemeral and dynamic environments we are in. So um, Envoy was developed with distributed systems, dynamic ephemeral environments in mind. Um, so Envoy, you can use Envoy as a service proxy, as an API gateway. Um, you can use it in many ways. Um, it is a proxy. Um, so it will sit in your data plane. That this is, you know, it's sitting in your data path. So end users come in, they call your service, uh, and they are going through an Envoy proxy. So it's a, it's a critical part of your um, infrastructure, this technology. It's very well proven um, and has been in production large scale now for, you know, many, many years, um, very stable. Um, and um, that stability um, is shining through because a lot of service mesh technologies are, are using it. Um, maybe they don't use it, you know, in the data path at all the places, but they do leverage it somewhere. Um, and there's a few that don't use it. So, so really that data path is where Envoy proxy sits or a proxy. Um, and then after you have that Envoy proxy there, um, it's about configuration, configuration changes. How do I now go and implement my service discovery, load balancing, circuit breaking, security policies to this proxy? Um, 
and you can hand roll it, right? You can do Envoy proxy configuration um, via Bash or whatever automation you may want to use. You can build your own control plane. So um, that's what a control plane does. It is really there to stream configuration to your Envoy proxy. Um, so this is all real-time dynamic without any interruption. So that, that's the key thing about Envoy proxy is that you're able to dynamically real-time configure it with whatever you want um, without any interruption to your service. Um, and so service meshes um, sit in this control plane side of things. Um, they typically there to manage configuration within your data plane. Um, and typically that data plane is, is made out of uh, on web proxy. Um, so our product, Blue Mesh, um, fits into that. Um, if you do use service mesh with Istio, um, these are the, what I mentioned before, sort of enterprise and um, production sort of requirements that, that you will have that we bring, you know, Istio is um, only N minus one support. So we have a bit more support uh, N minus four that roughly translates to about a year. Um, so some organizations appreciate that sort of um, rollout fashion. They don't feel wow. pressurized into upgrading all the time. Um, you know, we, we really shine in, in the multi-cluster and, and global failover. Um, and we'll see those sort of things as well. Um, multi-tenancy on your application network side. Um, that's that's a key requirement. Um, observability, of course. Um, and then WebAssembly um, is what we use and also Envoy proxy, really, um, to extend it. As I said before, you know, you don't have to wait for Istio to bring capabilities to your data plane. You can use WebAssembly to write your own um, extensions and safely um, push them into your um, service mesh as well. Uh, what we do is um, it's a it's a bit of a developer lifecycle um, using WebAssembly, so we've um, automated the tooling around that as well um, to really make that um, as seamless as possible for for you. Okay, that's it for the sort of background slides and so on we almost ready for the demo uh, okay if we can do is the poll yet uh, have a look okay, so which service means oh so then yeah that's cool glad i put it in there was sort of our thought. I wonder whether there's one word for selenium. I wonder if that's the um, person that's in production with service mesh. Other, okay, cool. Nice. Okay, so thanks for answering those. Yeah, I mean, so Istio's one there. Um, if, if there's anything we need to learn about cloud native is that everything changes. Um, and yeah, um, that, you know, I think Selenium is, is one of those new service mesh technologies that's really interesting. Um, and um, yeah, I wonder what the other one was, but you know, it's all, all comes down to requirements uh, as well. Um, but this is, this is a great, Sort of mix of um, answers and and what I was hoping for, obviously, um, Istio is is becoming the de facto service mesh as well. With you know, like I say, um, cloud native bringing its usual um, appetite for change as well. Open service mesh, okay. Into the okay. Just having a quick look at the chats, okay. Awesome, thanks. Um, okay, let's get into I find it. That, I find that really, really interesting because I would have thought that Linkerd would be much more popular. I know that it is wildly popular in China 
as an example, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah so no, I'm fascinated yeah. by this. It will, it will very much um, depend on, you know, sort of the skills in the area, um, what became successful and made it successful there. You know, if uh, if you're the first person somewhere and you use Linkerd, then you know people tend to copy. There's there's a lot of that that feeds into it. Um, yeah, and but but it will be requirements as well. What what we see with Linkerd though. Um, is that it's not an Envoy-based um, service mesh. Um, so they flawed their Correct. own. Uh, so that, that's going to be very, very hard to maintain um, in terms of just innovation, right? Um, like we said at the beginning with Istio going into CNCF, um, really the shackles are off. People will be contributing to it and, and pushing it forward, and that's... That's really what you want, um, that ability. Um, so it, it'd be interesting. I mean, LinkedIn is not going to go away. Um, who knows? They may even uh, come back in a big way. Um, you know, nothing set in stone. So, um, but yeah, LinkedIn. I mean, it's it's interesting. Um, I think probably one of the the biggest things that that come up if you look at LinkedIn and Istio is is probably. Uh, a lot of what people say is that um, Istio is more um, bloated and re you know you require more resources to to run um, Istio. LinkedIn seems a lot leaner in terms of resource um, requirements, um, which is not entirely true. Uh, I think default out of the box, yeah, sure, um, but really. Uh, if you look at a production configuration, they become a lot closer. Uh, and then Istio, with its capabilities and features, sort of take over. So, uh, so, so that's what I find interesting, right, is there's a bunch of other um, non-Istio-based service meshes out in the big bad world at the moment. But I think, um, you know, at the moment anyway, and probably into the future, I would imagine, Istio has uh, certainly grabbed the majority of the share. So Emad has popped something yeah. in the chat. You know, he says Istio and Linkerd. And recently, there's a lot of attention on Cilium since it isn't a since it's sidecarless. Yeah. Right? yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's why I said uh, it's it's quite yeah. interesting to see someone using Cilium. It's um, yeah. Uh, it's definitely uh, they're taking. I think this service mesh did it go GA recently or something like that. Um, or well, it's still in beta. Um, but yeah, they they are going um, with a comp. So Cilium um, is a CNI, um, so container network interface for Kubernetes. That's where their um, roots are. Um, and they use eBPF um, to do that. So eBPF is just, you can think of it as a kernel module. Um, so really everything they do is sort of in the kernel um, and um, BPF in general um, also will be um, rapidly expanding into XDP, which sits at your network card level. So that, they sort of sit in the node space, um, not so much in the container, um, which is the sidecar. So Istio, Linkerd, um, a lot of service meshes will have their proxy in the in the container or in the pod as a container, and, and that's called the sidecar. Um, where Selenium is taking a different approach, they are sitting within the kernel um, but of course, that then sits at the node level. Um, so um, there, there's other challenges for them. So um, while that removes the sidecar and therefore the resources around that, and you know, some people will argue that the sidecar adds latency because um, it's introducing extra hops. And definitely, if you look at the data path, um, there are extra hops. But if you actually go and measure things and 
you apply your organizational scale to it, um, it usually doesn't make sense. Um, so BPF and maybe the Selenium uh, service mesh may make sense for huge organizations, you know, like Google and Facebook and so on, where the scale and the global stretch of their network um, really that few percentage points makes makes a huge difference. But I think in general, for most organizations, um, that difference doesn't make uh, too much sense. Um, but it's it's definitely um, their CNI is un unbelievable. Um, it's it's really a great CNI. I think um, it's it's quite interesting to see how that and Calico will um, you know sort of pay off. Calico sort of well, I consider the, the de facto CNI at the moment. Um, EBPF and BPF brings a lot. Um, we'll be we're already looking at that as well. Like I said, nothing nothing is stable and set. Um, you know, we we look at these technologies and we look at how they will influence that application networking level um, and start engineering the best out of it into you know what we believe will be the future. So if you look at Selenium Service Mesh, um, and specifically they've released um, a blog, I think, in the last two days about their Service Mesh, and you know, they, they're very open about this as well. It, it comes from their um, blog, this information, um, is that um, if you, they, because they sit in the kernel and network card level, they are essentially level, um, layer four. Um, so they just sit at that layer four level. They don't have natively layer seven. So and layer seven is of course where all the good application um, requirements and policies sit. So they don't have that. Um, and when while their service mesh is able to bring layer seven capabilities, which they do via Envoy proxy, um, when they do that. And you compare, let's say, Istio as layer seven and Selenium as layer seven, they are exactly the same. So, um, just a little interesting fact there on Selenium, yeah. Um, but but it's it's great. I think in terms of, and this is BPF in general. Um, in terms of observability, it's it's probably the thing I'm, I'm most excited about for for Selenium. But BPF in general, really, it's. Um, it's really interesting how much they can um, deduce. I mean, at that level, they you know can um, put context around a packet in terms of the pod and container, um, which is is pretty pretty interesting. If you look at Calico, for instance, and its network policy, um, it's quite hard, and you, and you're triaging it, it. It can become hard to to see and correlate packets back to a pod uh, just because of Kubernetes overlay network architecture, where with Selenium CNI, um, you know, that context is known. Um, and so, you know, it becomes really great. So in, in terms of CNI, awesome, awesome, um, just for that reason, I think. Um, okay, so this is the uh, demo environment. Um, We've got uh, a provisioned um, three clusters um, with the classic Istio book info application that we'll be using. Um, yeah, I've, I've, uh, let me get to my notes. So I've added just um, Metal LB for the service type load balancing. Um, this is actually all running on my laptop. So I'm using Minikube. Um, the idea of this is that we are learning, right? So one of the best ways to learn is on your laptop. So whatever I'm showing you, anyone can do on their laptops as well. Um, so I'm just using um, Minikube, provision three clusters with that. And they're all single node. Um, with a few resources just to be able to to manage all the applications and so on. Um, I've also pre-installed Istio 1.11. I've installed Glue Mesh as well. That's going to help me and make sure we don't um, 
run out of time and the demo application. So that's basically where we are at the moment. Just before we hook into it, can everyone just pop in the chat if that's big enough to be able to see or does it need to be a little bit larger? I'll go back. We'll just wait for a moment. Yeah. I'm just wondering if the size is going to be too small. Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. Good day, guys. It's Mr. Wallace speaking. Sorry for being late. <laughs> hey, Ian. Hey. I was just wondering whether you've got one of these super, super wide monitors with an enormous resolution. I was just making a mental note that we should specify a max resolution for all people, <laughs> old eyes like me. Yeah. Okay, so so we've got a bunch of we've got three answers so far. The terminal could be bigger, but everyone else mm. says it looks okay. Right. They must have better better eyesight than me. I am blind. <laughs> yeah. You no can. laughing, Mr. Wallace. <laughs> uh, let's see what I can do this side. Um, let's see. All right. Cool. So that's what I have prepared. So hopefully, yeah, if all of that is working, um, the application should come up. So, uh, yeah, it's on there. Let's test that. Yay. That's a good start. Okay, so book info, um, it allows us to visually see how the traffic is moving. Um, so in cluster one, we have two versions of reviews running. Um, re version one um, has no stars. Version two has black stars. And then in cluster, the second cluster, we have a version three which will show red stars. So that's that's really part of the reason we we're using that. So at the moment, um, everything's up and running. We can hit the application. Um, so I wanted to show Zero Trust. There's so much to show, um, but I wanted to start with Zero Trust. I think it's it's an awesome use case for Service Mesh as well. Um, so this is how Istio does that. Um, it's really just an automated PKI within your application network. So Istio Control Plane has its own certificate authority. Um, and as new pods are being provisioned into your cluster and Service Mesh, um, it will inject the Istio agent. The Istio agent will create a service uh, certificate request to um, Istio control plane, um, and Istio control plane will sign and issue a workload certificate, which is then attached to that service proxy, the sidecars which we spoke about earlier. Um, and so that's really how um, identity is established. It's you know, your bulk standard X509 certificate um, for that specific pod. Um, and with that identity, of course, um, you can now go, okay, well, since your <coughs> um, identity is known, do I want to authorize this, you know, identity to have certain rights within your service mesh? Um, so that's, that's um, what we'll be looking at, a lot of certificate stuff. Um, so some of the challenges that we'll have with, you know, two different clusters um, on two different networks, and, and we want zero trust across them. We want to um, say, okay, uh, everything needs to identify, authenticate, and be authorized before any connections are allowed. Um, so, um, you know, within a Istio service mesh or a service mesh, um, you know, you can accomplish that, but with between clusters, there are challenges. And the challenge is the fact that by default, your Istio control plane will create its own certificate authority and root authority, and each cluster will have its own root authority. Um, and therefore, service A in this cluster will not trust service B because they are issued from a different PKI and, and root CA. So part of what we want to solve as well, um, it's, it's a little bit advanced, but it's multi-cluster multi, multi -cluster, 
And what we do is we create a shared route. Um, and because the shared route is used to um, create intermediate certificates in each one of these um, Istio control planes, um, between the two clusters, um, workloads are now able to establish MTLS. So they can use MTLS to authenticate between each other. And once you have authentication, you can do the authorization um, with that as well. So um, that's a pretty cool um, concept. So um, what we'll be doing is creating a shared route issuing um, intermediate CAs to each of So you're just starting on MTLS and intermediate CAs? Oh, OK. Fair enough. Sorry. OK. So um, essentially, yeah, I uh, wasn't paying attention to the bottom screen, so I didn't know everyone dropped off. But um, Istio creates its own PKI and automates all your certificate management. Um, with multi-cluster, you need to create a shared route um, so that you can establish zero trust between clusters um, so that they can trust each other. Um, so I went through you know, that sort of setup and, and just showed um, on the side normal certificates being used. Um, you, know, you pull out the certificates as secrets. Um, and if you have a look at them, it's normal X509 certificates, nothing wildly exciting, um, except that you don't even know there's a PKI um, running all of this. So that, that's pretty awesome when I first had a look at service meshes and zero trust and these certificates, because certificate management it, it was the bane of my life for many years, um, you know, just looking at rotation and all that sort of stuff. So um, Istio takes care of all of that. and. Yeah, um, it's used for zero trust because the certificate is issued to the pod. Pod gets an identity because you have a certificate, you can do MTLS. So pods can mutually authenticate each other. And once they authenticate it, you can do authorization policies. So that's essentially where we are now. Now that um, we have our PKI set up so that both clusters, the workloads in each cluster can talk to each other and authenticate each other um, will enable um, zero trust. So um, if we go back to the application now, uh, we can see with zero trust, and that, that zero trust says everything is untrusted. Everything needs to be verified. So yes, um, you know, we haven't set up a policy to say, okay, we will allow this connection to happen. So we'll run through a few commands where we now need to go and say, okay, um, we actually explicitly on a granular level have to go and say, okay, a connection from the Ingress gateway to the product page is allowed. Um, and of course, I'm just stepping through this for, for demo purposes. In, in real life, you're right, the policies at the time that you introduce your service. Um, but um, just to show the concept of zero trust, um, you can now see, okay, we, we're not able to make that connection because zero trust is in place. Um, but now we've applied a policy that should allow that um, connection. So um, we refresh that, we can see, okay, we're hitting the product page, but we can see there's still no reviews, no ratings, because again, zero trust is literally that. Nothing trusts anything else. So uh, we need to go and enable those authorizations as well. Um, so let's go and do that. Uh, and I'll just uh, skip through these a little bit more. Usually, um, you can show this on a service by service, microservice sort of basis. So, um, literally, you know, each connection uh, traffic of the application network needs to be allowed with zero trust in place. So, with all of those policies in place now, the authorizations essentially, um, we should be back to um, the normal service. And we can see that's all back. 
So that's a that's a quick sort of illustration of what we mean with zero trust. Um, and you know, it's 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 pretty awesome. Uh, gotta gotta say, with um, you know, if you have any interest in security, um, and and the fact that we're doing this in a declarative fashion, um, it's it's really good. Um, okay, so for the next part, um, you know, we said application networking between clusters so we want to show that so that's what the next uh, demonstration is um, what i'm going to do is with this policy that i've just applied i'm saying i'm shifting traffic and 75 percent of the traffic needs to go to version 3 which is in cluster 2. so users are still coming in to cluster 1 um, but with service mesh, we are shifting traffic to version three in cluster two. Uh, again, very seamless, and it's not working, which is planned because zero trust needs to work across clusters as well. So, um, just to illustrate zero trust again, what what is meant by zero trust? Um, I think in uh in some um, network technologies of the past it was almost referred to as micro segmentation which i quite like it, it's really taking each service and saying don't trust anything else um, and we are seeing an illustration of that um, so we've and there we go so now for the first time we're seeing those red version three stars here which means we're coming into cluster one uh, and service mesh is directing traffic to cluster two um, as per the policy. And so that's all good. Let's do a bit of disaster recovery if time will allow us. I think so. Um, so let's remove that shift, uh, bring it back to just Plus the one, so we see no longer we're back to our original state. Um, what we want to show now is service interruption. That's that's obviously another key sort of capability we want for our applications. Um, so uh, we apply our policies here. Um, I'll quickly put them in and have a look. Doing. So the important bit here um, is this section of the policy. So we're saying keep keep the traffic in cluster one um, as long as the service is available, um, because you know cluster two could be in a different region and a different part of the globe. Users in Sydney want to be kept in the Sydney cluster, we don't want to be talking to US West um, unless that service fails. So that's what we're doing here now. Um, so we've applied that policy um, and you can see here we're using the outlier detection um, and that's uh, essentially you know, Envoy Proxy, it comes from Envoy Proxy and that's telling Envoy Proxy the criteria for when it should consider a service as unavailable. Um, so let's go and have a look. Everything is still up and running. Then a couple of times, uh, and then we can just go and put the reviews container to sleep. So we're just using a deployment patch to mimic the service becoming unavailable. Uh, Give that a few seconds to kick in. And there we can see automatically we are now being served from cluster two. You can see that because the red arrows are appearing as well. And so it's not that visible here. So what I do is just have a look at cluster two, just tail the um, logs for the cluster two review service. that up and running and we can see as we 
now browse we are hitting the cluster two. Okay, so that's it, and um, we can revert everything back. Um, you know, this is this is part of what I started off with in terms of being cloud native, Kubernetes native. These policies are declarative. We are very seamlessly, dynamically um, configuring things. Um, you know, um, to add policies, remove policies, all of that um, is really very. I would almost say straightforward. So, hopefully, yeah, all back here. Uh, you can see we go to this. Yeah. Back in cluster one, and this should be, yeah. And that's it. Sorry, sorry about that connection loss. Um, it was really me just going into Kubernetes secrets, taking <laughs> out certificates and looking at certificates. Just to, just to illustrate, we are just using normal X509, PKI, but Istio and Service Mesh is automating that. Um, and the certificates is what allow us to do zero trust. Um, so that, that was the, the section I think you missed out on. Um, and then obviously, um, not just zero trust, but you know, some of the other use cases is, is that application traffic management that we did as well. Um, really, really powerful stuff. Did we run through all the um, polls? Or is there any, any questions? Well, we have completed all of the polls. The fifth one we did while we were um, Ah, oh, okay. While well, I was waiting, and Nick says, okay. "Great presentation." There is a question from Craig Moyle in the chat. Yeah. Um, he says, "So, if you're having to set up Istio so the clusters trust each other, why not just spin up apps in separate node pools in one cluster?" And I can think of a bunch of answers, but uh, where I oh, don't see that. Is it in the chat? Yeah, it's in the chat. If you are meaning to set up this Um Okay, so not a hundred percent sure what he means by the node pools in one cluster, but um yeah, um so Obviously, like we said, I mean these clusters could be multi-cloud, right? You don't, you don't, you're not, you're not pinned down to doing what I've just done here um, in one region or one cloud provider. I can build this same demo running between AKS, EKS, and GKE. In fact. That was the previous demo that was successful that I mentioned earlier. Um, so, so I suppose that hopefully answers that question for him. I mean, definitely that you, you don't have to do this stuff. It, it's um, you know, as as we look at should we adopt service mesh? Look at your use cases. What what do you want to do? If you don't need to fail over between clusters, you have a platform that's based on node pools in some way with resilience in there. Don't don't do it for that reason. But um, if you want TLS encryption between your services, there's a good use case for it. I, I think you know even if you're not doing multi-cluster, multi-cloud, like we talked about here, you don't have to do um, zero trust, right? Um, you can just encrypt all traffic. That that was the first part of the the demonstration. Is really just enabling TLS here. So that's already a very powerful use case. You know, um, we ran through quite a few use cases here, but imagine just enabling with you know a few clicks and a few pushes um, TLS between all your services. Um, so there's a use case. Other use cases for for services maybe um, observability. A lot of people will go, okay, you know, we've got one cluster, uh, and you know, 
hundreds of microservices, thousands of microservices. Um, how do we visualize, triage um, that service mesh can do that for you? That's that's another sort of use case that we see people um, use. And you can use it for just that. You don't even have to. If you don't want to encrypt traffic between your services, you don't have to. But maybe you want observability, so you use service mesh for that. Um, you know, I just picked picked a few ones that I probably gravitate towards. Um, um, but there's there's many use cases for for service mesh. Um, I don't know whether that answered uh, the question there for Craig. Yeah. Um, looks like it. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? I've got a very quick one, uh, Dan. It's Stephen again. Um, you, you're associated with um, Solo. I'm just wondering, and I really don't know the answer. This is not a rhetorical question, but like, what do you? I mean, what do you guys? What do you guys do? What do you make? You know, how do you make money? What what sort of business problems do you solve? In a bit of a nutshell. Yeah. Um, so really, it's that um, multi-cluster space that that our products shine, um, and to sort of put a nutshell on it. Um, once you start delving into Istio service meshes, um, there's a lot of information, you know, the, the learning curve can feel quite quite heavy. Um, but really service mesh and, and Istio has matured to the level where a lot of the hard work that was associated with it before is gone. Um, and, and we addressing the areas like um, where you start scaling, and like we said, you know, multi-cluster, multi-cloud. That that's really where our products shine. Um, we really um, abstract away your service mesh, so you don't have to know that you're running on Istio. Um, you don't have to know Istio. You just interact with our control plane, our management plane. Issue your commands to the management plane. And it will do all the configuration for you. You know everything else in terms of what can feel like complexity um, is abstracted away. Um, so a large part of this demo, um, you know, was possible in this time because we're using Vue Mesh. Um, you know, it's uh, it's really about abstracting away the application network um, complexities that come with service meshes. Um, you know, we. Yeah. Sorry, that's sounding pretty useful. I, I was going to say so. Solo, solo dot io, or they can hook up with you on LinkedIn. That'd be about right. Yes. Yeah. Um. So we've got the deck available. Please, please uh, download it um, with all the contacts. But the easy ones are solo io. Um. Actually, we we're running. I see from the poll there there was a um question about um. Uh, uh, what you guys would like to, or everyone would like to see next, um, and Istio Foundational um, came up as an answer. Um, tomorrow, uh, I'm running a Istio in production workshop. It will be from I think 2 p.m. our time. The link for that hopefully is also available in the in the handouts, the registration page. Um, and so that and that's Istio. Uh, it's not product again. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but um, you know where we where we look a little bit closer. We take two and a half hours, and you do virtual hands-on labs. Um, you get to you know run the demo yourself um, and and sort of experience uh, things like that. So we we go through the Istio installation and um, you know what you need to consider for uh, running Istio in production. Um, you know, the tricks and stuff that we've learned over many years working with, you know, organizations that, that really implement um, this in anger in and at scale and in production. Um, so we go through that sort of stuff. Um, I often say, you know, join, join it. Um, it's recorded. You get the recording afterwards. So even if you register, you will get the recording if you just want to do a recording. But if um, and and we run um, those workshops, we do uh, Istio foundational and then uh, Istio production, 
and then an Istio expert. Um, and, you know, we run them all the time globally. So just go to our events page as well and, and register for any of our events. They're all free online. Um, find a time that suits you. We run them in all regions. So all of the workshops run in all regions. Um, and sometimes you can just come and sit and look at it as well. You don't have to do the hands-on part. Even. Uh, but yeah, if anyone's interested, tomorrow we're doing a production one. Uh, and, the, and the link should be in the handouts, I think. So go ahead and register. Yeah, so yeah. the links the links are in the handouts, in the handout section on the left. Um, you can also ping Dan um, directly on... LinkedIn, he's a very nice chap, yeah, as you've yeah. seen. Even if he does live yeah. in a broom, broom cupboard, he's still a very nice chap. 